Hi and welcome back to the Dr O'Donovan Medicine Made Easy YouTube channel. Today we're going to be looking at melanoma, otherwise known as malignant melanoma. So let's get straight into today's lecture. Okay, so in this lecture we're going to look at four different things. First of all, we're going to look at the definition of melanoma. We're then going to look at the causes and risk factors. We'll then look at clinical features. And then finally, we'll look at treatment. If you're interested in finding out more about the resources I used or any of the primary sources, I've included these in the description box below the video. So we're going to start off by looking at the definition of melanoma. And a melanoma is simply a skin cancer which arises from a cell called the melanocyte. So I'm going to draw melanocyte here. We'll call this the melanocyte. And the melanocyte sits just at the junction between the epidermis and the dermis. So this here is a cross section of the skin. And we've got the top layer here, which is the epidermis. And you have the bottom layer here, which is the dermis. And at this junction between the epidermis and dermis, you have a layer just at the bottom of the epidermis called the stratum basale. And within this, the melanocytes sit. So we can draw some melanocytes in here. Now, if these mutate over time, those can turn into melanomas. Now, most commonly, the sites of melanoma is the skin, but you can also get them in places like the eyes, you can get them in the intestine, you can get them in the mouth, anywhere where a melanocyte is and becomes mutated. Now, in men, the most common site is the back, and in women, the most common site to find a melanoma are the legs. So let's move on now and have a look at the causes and risk factors for melanoma. And we're going to talk about that on the next slide. So primarily, what you're going to be concerned about is excessive exposure to UVA and UVB light. And that can be from things such as the sun. This is my very bad drawing of the sun. And also things like sunbeds. So someone who has come into the GP complaining of a new itching, bleeding mole, and they say to you, I've spent lots of time in the sun or on sunbeds, you should start to become concerned and think, could this person potentially have a melanoma? Now you need to look at certain risk factors. So these are things that make that person more likely to develop a melanoma. So the first one that you're going to think about is fair skin or light skin, people who burn easily. And we'll talk about that just a little bit later. Um, the second issue that you want to think about is, is the person immunosuppressed? So if someone is immunosuppressed, they're more likely to develop melanoma. Do they have a personal or family history of melanoma? So if somebody comes in and says, my mum or my dad had melanoma, they're more likely to develop melanoma. Other risk factors include conditions such as xeroderma, pigmentosum, or certain genetic conditions that predispose people to melanoma. So other risk factors include something called atypical mole syndrome. And this is where someone has over 50 moles on their body. And three of these or more are atypical. Atypical in this case means over five millimeters or unusual in shape or color. So something that's over five millimeters or unusual in shape or color. If you have atypical mole syndrome, you're at a seven to tenfold increased risk of melanoma. Now, we mentioned here that fair skin predisposes people to melanoma, and you can classify that on something called the Fitzpatrick skin type classification scale. And I'll just erase this and we can talk about that now. So Fitzpatrick was a professor at Harvard who came up with a six point gradient scale ranging from one all the way through to six. Now, one is that you always burn when you're in the sun, but you never tan 
So someone like me who's very pale and I can never get a suntan, but I always burn. Now, level six is the opposite of this. This is that you always tan when you're in the sun, but you never burn. And in between this, you have gradients. So you have two, three, four, and five. Now it's important to know about this because if you're level one skin type, you're at much greater risk of developing noma, melanoma compared to someone who's at level six. But that's not to say that people who are level three, four, five, and even six aren't at risk for melanoma. They still can develop melanoma. It just means that there's slightly decreased risk than someone from level one. So let's move on now and have a look at what the clinical symptoms and features of melanoma are. So when someone comes into the clinic, what you need to be looking out for. So let's have a look at the clinical features, symptoms of melanoma. Now typically someone will present to your clinic and they'll complain of something like a evolving or bleeding or itching mole that they think is getting bigger. And a great way to assess for that is to use a scale called the A, B, C, D, E scale. Now A stands for asymmetry, B stands for border, C stands for colour, D stands for diameter, and E stands for evolving. So let's use the ABCDE criteria to look at these images provided by the Skin Cancer Foundation of melanomas. Um, if you look at A here, A stands for asymmetry. And if you draw a line down the middle of this melanoma, you can see on the left as I'm looking at the screen, there is a black area which I'm highlighting now that's slightly raised. Whereas on the right as I'm looking at the screen, there's this flatter, browner area. And this is clearly asymmetrical. If this line down the middle which I'm just going to highlight now, was a mirror, then you'd expect this side to be the same as this side, and they're clearly not. So this is asymmetrical, and it raises suspicions of a melanoma. If we look at B, remember B standard for border, and we draw a line around the outside of this melanoma here, you can see that the border is uneven and it's jagged. And you may even get something called notching or stepping, where the raised bit of the melanoma then drops down. So this border is uneven, and this again raises your suspicions. If we look at C, C stands for colour, and we're going to use this melanoma as an example. So you have a black area that I'm highlighting in blue here. If we go to yellow, we can also see that there are some pinker areas, which I'm highlighting here. And right next to it, which we use green for, there are some brown areas. So this multicolored um, feature of this melanoma also raises your suspicions. And um, remember D stands for diameter. And the figure that you're going to be looking at is, is it greater than six millimeters in diameter? So here, when this ruler is put against the melanoma, if you just draw a line down here to the marking points on the ruler, and each one of these is a millimetre. You can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is nine millimetres, which is obviously raising suspicions. And finally, E stands for evolving. So is the melanoma changing in size over time? And is it expanding? So for example, if we look at this one here, it may have only started off in this small area, but over time it's grown out. Now that would raise suspicions for a melanoma. So carrying on with the clinical assessment and workup of a suspicious lesion, you want to ideally be seen by a specialist, someone like a dermatologist. And this is where some people say E is expert. So make sure that you get the lesion seen by an expert. And they'll typically use something like a dermatoscope, which is like a magnifying glass to assess the lesion further. Um, there's lots of different subtypes of melanoma histologically that you can read more about if you're interested. But for the purpose of this session, I'll just touch on two. So the two ones that I want to touch on histologically are superficial spreading. And this accounts for roughly 70% of all melanomas. And the second one that I want you to be aware of is a nodular melanoma. And this accounts for roughly 
10 to 20% of melanomas. And it's important to know about this one because these types of melanomas grow more in depth than width. So they tend to go down rather than out. It's also important to know that melanomas can be distinguished as to whether or not they're in situ or whether or not they are invasive. Now, by describing a melanoma as invasive, it means it's bridged the basement membrane, which is the border between the epithelial cells and the underlying connective tissue. This can become problematic because these invasive melanomas can spread, and that's obviously a very bad sign. Now, staging of tumours is done using the American Joint Committee on Cancer TNM system, which stands for tumour, so that's looking at whether or not the thickness and it's ulcerated. N is nodes, so has it spread to the lymph nodes? And M is metastasized. Has it spread anywhere further? So places like the brain. Now we've had a look at the clinical symptoms and features of melanoma and how to assess it. We'll just move on briefly to look at management of melanoma, which comprises the last section of this talk. So this is the final section of the talk, and this is looking at management of melanoma. Now, sometimes a doctor will look at a mole or a suspicious lesion and think that it doesn't need to be immediately removed. If they decide on this, then it's important that they take a photograph of the lesion. And they'll need to compare this photograph in three months' time, according to the NICE guidelines in the UK and they'll assess for the change in the lesion to see if it's growing or expanding. Remember, E constituted part of the ABCDE workup for evolving. It's also important to remember that assessing your body regularly and noting um, changes in moles is a really important part of your own self-assessment for melanoma. For a diagnosis of lesions suspicious for melanomas, then the clinician will want to do something called an excisional, biopsy. Essentially what this means is they'll want to cut the lesion out. Now there's lots of different types of excisional techniques and the amount of border that is removed depends on the site and size of the melanoma but typically you want to remove a minimum of 10 millimeters or one centimeter up to 2.5 centimeters and there's lots of reading that you can do around this in the different types. Now, I'm just going to erase this section here I'll talk very briefly about the excisional biopsy techniques and some that you might want to just briefly be aware of. So the options that you should be aware of include wide local excision, otherwise known as WLE, or you can have margin controlled excision, which is a type of surgery known as Mohs surgery. And this is often done under microscope. So instead of taking, say, two centimeters, they might take 0.5 millimetres to one centimetre. But as I said, one centimetre is the crucial number. So ideally, you want to be removing 10 millimetres from the border edge. So if this is your melanoma, you need to be taking out of this direction here, here, and here, at least one centimetre. And that's to stop the melanoma from reoccurring. Because the melanoma usually spreads to lymph nodes, a biopsy of the sentinel lymph node is sometimes undertaken. So the sentinel lymph node is the nearest draining lymph node to that site. So in early superficial melanomas, this isn't usually done as the risk of cancer having spread to the lymph nodes is very low. If the melanoma has spread and it's more advanced, then the part of treatment can involve removal of the lymph nodes, but this has to be weighed up by the patient and clinician and considering the risks and benefits. There's a good table outlining these risks and benefits and you can find it in the NICE guidelines link in the description section of this video. After the local melanoma has been excised, a decision will be made as to whether or not you need to add on additional or adjuvant therapy such as chemotherapy or immunotherapy, but this is usually reserved for people with more advanced disease. Furthermore, if you've got advanced disease in the UK, NICE recommends that you can undertake CT scanning just to see if it's spread to areas such as the brain, or if someone is less than 24 months old, so very young children, then they are usually recommended to have MRI scanning. It's also important that follow-up of patients is really key, and this will also depend on the severity of the disease as to the frequency of follow-up.
and it's important to involve the specialist skin cancer multidisciplinary team in management. It's also important to offer psychological support and teach people how to do self-examination and monitor for new moles. In terms of prognosis, well, it all depends on how advanced the disease is. From figures from the United States, survival is 99% amongst those with localised disease. So that's melanoma that hasn't spread. For people where it's spread to lymph nodes, survival rate is 65%. However, it falls to as low as 25% in those with distant spread. So it's really important that melanoma is picked up at a very early stage to avoid this. So remember, prevention is better than cure and try to encourage people to use plenty of sunscreen when outside and avoid use of sunbeds. Thanks again for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please remember to like and subscribe. I'd also like to thank Dr. Johnny Guckian, who is a registrar in dermatology in Leeds for checking this video for accuracy. He posts some really great content on Twitter, so if you'd like to follow him, I've included his Twitter handle in the description box below. I've also posted some clinical cases in the comments section beneath this video. These are hypothetical cases based around the topic of melanoma. Just write your answers beneath each question and I'll get back to you with my feedback and thoughts. Thanks once again for watching and tune in next week for a new video on a new topic.